Well, yesterday we left Simon Peter having answered the call, that after the Lord called him three times, he made the commitment that he was going to leave it behind and follow Jesus. But what now? What would he learn regarding his discipleship? And who was it that he was truly following? True, this was a great teacher, but he was about to learn that this was somebody much greater than just a great teacher. Jesus had a plan for Peter, but it was going to take time for Jesus to really be able to prepare Peter for the job and the, and the task that he had before him. In a lot of ways, what Jesus was doing was he was planting seeds into Peter that wouldn't produce fruit until years later. But Jesus continued to work patiently with Peter to try to prepare him and to develop him for what lay ahead. We know that Peter made the commitment to follow Jesus, but we noted yesterday that commitment and conversion are not the same thing. That committing one's life to doing something is different than being converted in one's mind to truly follow after. We can see this commonly happening in the life of Peter, but where there's this recurrence of the need for things to happen multiple times, I'd just like to pause for a moment and to take a look at a number of these occurrences that occur within the life of Peter. We noted yesterday the three calls that Peter experienced. There's three catches of fish that Peter has in his life. The one that we looked at yesterday in Luke 5. There's one in Matthew 17 where he pulls the fish with the hook and finds the coin. And then there's the one in John 21. There's three resurrections that Peter witnesses personally to help prepare him for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the widow of Nain, her son. There's Jairus' daughter, and there's Lazarus. He's part of the inner three group of disciples that witness three unique events. The resurrection of Jairus' daughter, the glorification of Christ in the transfiguration, and the witnessing of the suffering of the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's three declarations that Peter makes as Jesus being the Son of God. There's three predictions that Jesus gives to the disciples concerning his crucifixion, to try to prepare them for the fact that he truly was going to die. There's three warnings of denial that he gives to Peter to try to help him grasp the reality that he wasn't where he thought he truly was. Three times Jesus finds Peter sleeping in Gethsemane. We're aware of the three denials of Jesus that Peter does. The three questions that the Lord gives to Peter, a repetition it would seem, but there was a deeper lesson as we'll once consider in a future class. Do you love me, Peter? And there's three visions and three men that Peter experiences as the vision of the sheet is let down from heaven. And three men show up at Peter's door and he opens the door to the Gentiles. Transformation takes time, it takes repetition, and it takes patience. This is a big lesson from the life of Peter. God knows that it takes time for our transformation to take place. And it's important for us to carry an intensity in our discipleship, to have the passion of Peter that drives action. But it's important that we match that passion with a patience, to know that a transformation takes a lifetime. It's the quote that our brother Bob Lloyd used to say, to please be patient with me because God is not finished with me yet. We can tend to be patient with ourselves once we get to that realization, but it's important that we apply that same patience to our brothers and sisters, to our children, to our families, knowing that God is working with them. Sometimes we can take a snapshot of where someone's at in time, and that snapshot becomes fixed, but we know that life is not static, that life is dynamic, and that slowly change is taking place in the chrysalis. This is a big lesson from the life of Peter, a lesson that we'll see to recur over and over again as Jesus continues to work with Peter. In our class today, what we hope to do is to take a look at this aspect of where Peter learns what it means to be a disciple, learns who it is that he's truly following. We'll walk through the narrative with him in his footsteps, and we'll key in on specific events, the walking of Peter on the water. We'll see as well him in Caesarea Philippi, of where he makes the declaration that Jesus was the Son of God and the commendation that he receives from Jesus as a result. And we'll conclude by considering briefly 
the events of the Transfiguration. There were things that happened in the days following Peter's commitment to be one of the 12 disciples. Think for a moment about some of the things that Peter and the others would have witnessed. They would have heard a number of miracles, or heard a number of parables, rather, seen a number of miracles that were done by the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark chapters 4 and 5 helped to outline some of these for us, of where he spoke numerous parables throughout the day, and they wondered, why are you speaking in parables? Well, now a time of decision had come for those to whom Jesus was speaking. The first two years of the ministry was all about defining for people what the kingdom of God looked like and what a citizen of the kingdom of heaven needed to be. But now Jesus was making it time to make a decision. People needed to decide what they were going to do. And so he began to speak in parables to drive this decision on the part of the people. Well, having heard a number of parables, Jesus and his disciples go across the Sea of Galilee. And they experience a storm of where the disciples believe that they're going to die. But Jesus, with just a word, calms the storm. And they wonder, what manner of man is this that can control even the wind and the waves? They reach the other side and they're met with yet another storm. A man who calls himself Legion. But Jesus is able to heal this man. And they see a herd of 2,000 swine go plummeting into the sea. They're kicked out of the coast. And they return back to the west. Back to Capernaum. Where they're met once again by a throng of people. As they're walking through the throng, Jesus stops and turns around. And says, who touched me? And Peter's incredulous. He's recorded as actually saying, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who toucheth thee? But he learned that Jesus knew exactly who touched him, that his master was more than just a great teacher, and the perception of Jesus exceeded even what Peter expected. From there, Peter was given the special privilege of being one of the three that would go in and see the healing, the resurrection of the only daughter of Jairus, who was the ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum. Just imagine the significance that that would have for Peter himself. Remember, Peter's house was in Capernaum. He would know personally who the ruler of that synagogue was. He would know Jairus. He would know the love that Jairus had for his only daughter. And Peter was one of the three disciples that was privileged to see the resurrection of this little girl brought back to life. Peter was learning so much as he saw the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter must have cast in his mind what manner of man was this, one who could calm the sea, one who could heal the mind, could cure infirmity, and could raise the dead. On top of all of this, Jesus spoke with absolute authority. But this man was only 32 years old. He had never been to a rabbinical school. In fact, he grew up as a carpenter. But he spoke with authority that nobody else could contest. This was a man that was more than a man. He was not only the Son of Man, but the Son of God. Well, the third Passover came along. This was now one year prior to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the disciples fed the 5,000 in Bethsaida. Originally, what the disciples had wanted to do with the Lord was to escape the multitude, to spend some time with Jesus, to share with him what it was that they were experiencing in their discipleship. But Jesus sees the multitude as a sheep without a shepherd, and as a result, he feeds them. But the problem is that right after he feeds them, the multitude want to take him and make him king by force in John 6 and verse 15. But Jesus knows that this is exactly the opposite direction that he's trying to take his disciples in. And so he constrains his disciples to enter into a boat and sends them off, dismisses the multitude, and he himself goes into a mountain to pray. This was not what Jesus needed right now. He was trying to prepare his mind for what lay ahead, and he was trying to prepare his disciples that things were not going to go as they expected. He was not going to be made king when he went down to Jerusalem. Well, we're told in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 25 that the disciples toiled on the sea for hours and didn't make progress. In fact, we're told that it was the fourth watch of the night. If we could just turn to Matthew chapter 14 for a moment, this is where we'll spend a, a few minutes considering what it was that Peter would have learned from this particular instance. The fourth watch of the night 
would have meant that it was after 3 a.m. So they were toiling for hours in the sea and not making any progress with getting back to Capernaum as they traveled from the east to the west across the Sea of Galilee. Well, they see what they thought was a spirit. And we're told in Mark 6 and verse 48 that Jesus would have passed them by. But they cried out, and when they cried out, Jesus responded. And you wonder perhaps if there's a lesson here, that Jesus is continually present, but is waiting for us to call out for help before taking action. Be that as it may, Peter says something that has struck many of us as rather curious, which comes up in Matthew 14 and verse 28. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And we wonder, why would Peter make such a request as this? Why not, Lord, if it be thou, come to us? That's probably what most of us would say. We wouldn't even think about getting out and going on to the water. But Peter had a desire to be with the Lord. He wanted to go to where the Lord was. Instead, Peter is asking for the Lord to invite him to come out into the sea. At a time when all the other disciples were clinging on to the boat for dear life, the boat is heaving up and down in the waves. Peter is asking to get out of the boat and to walk on the sea to be with his Lord. And with one simple word, come, Peter is out of the boat walking to Jesus. How many times do you think that Peter had seen somebody walk on the water before this? Probably about as many times as we have. But that childlike faith that our brother Joe is been exhorting us on, was present in the life of Peter. It's interesting to see the word that Matthew uses here in chapter 14 and verse 24. This word where it says that he was tossed with the waves. The boat was tossed with the waves. That word tossed actually means tortured. And so the boat is being tortured by the waves. And here's Peter climbing over the side of the boat to start walking on those waves to be with Jesus. It's easy to be critical of Peter in this situation, isn't it? To look at Peter and say, yep, well, first, why would you get out of the boat? But second, he begins to sink. But the reality is that Peter walked on the water. Peter was walking on the water to be with Christ. There's no words of correction here from Christ. Christ doesn't rebuke him for this. But I believe in Christ's gentle way that he was helping Peter to learn through this experience. Consider a few of the things that Jesus was teaching Peter through this experience on the water. Because as long as he keeps his eyes on Christ, he's walking. But as soon as he takes his eyes off the Lord, he sinks. Do you note the contrast there in verse 30? When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. That's the key. Eyes on the Lord we walk, eyes off the Lord, we sink. When we get distracted with the other things around us, that causes us to falter and to fail. Jesus was teaching Peter that you have to come to me, but it will be fa by faith and focus, not on your own abilities. This was something that Peter would see as he reflected later. I used to think when I would read this story that Peter began to sink. He's walking to Christ and it's kind of like quicksand and, and slowly he's sinking and he's crying out for help to Christ. But the Greek doesn't read that way. It reads that he began to drown. And so as soon as he takes his eyes off the Lord and he becomes fearful, he's down up to his neck in water instantaneously, fighting for breath, calling to the Lord, drowning. That's how quickly it can happen when we take our eyes off the mark. That's what Jesus was showing Peter here through experiential knowledge. Peter, as he reflected on this later, would never forget this experience. He was teaching Peter the need for prayer and the importance of it. Jesus was there the whole time. But note, it's when Peter cries out for help that the Lord takes action. In verse 31, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, Wherefore didst thou doubt? Immediately, Jesus takes action. God takes action immediately when we pray. 
Many of us have prayed for things for quite a while and we don't see the response. We don't get the immediate hand that pulls us up out of the situation. But that doesn't mean that God is not immediately acting on our behalf. We're going through Daniel in our first class together. It took three weeks in Daniel chapter 10 before Daniel could see the angel come and help him. But Michael tells him, from the moment that you set your heart to seek me, he took action. But it took three weeks before Peter could see it. And sometimes it takes a long time for us before we see the answer to a prayer. But it's important that we pray in the midst of difficulty. The Lord is ready to help, but we have to recognize our need and we have to pray is the principle that was coming to Peter. And the last one is in regards to fellowship. Because when the Lord picks Peter up out of the water, the two of them don't turn and then walk over to Capernaum and leave the rest behind. But instead, Jesus takes Peter back to the boat and both of them get into the boat together. And there's a subtle lesson here, isn't there? That if you're going to come to Christ, Peter, you can't be doing it on your own. You have to come to me with your brethren. And we have to come to Christ with our brothers and sisters in the ecclesia. There's a quote that says, if you think you're leading and you look behind you and no one's there, then you're going for a walk. <laughs> and when Peter looked behind him, nobody was there. And Jesus is teaching him, you need to lead from among the flock. You need to lead from among your brethren. And the way that you will come to me, the way that you will be with me, is if you lead among your brethren. So Jesus is gently teaching Peter here that he couldn't come to him in his own strength, that he needed to ask for help, that faith and focus were the key to success. And as soon as he took his eye off the prize, as soon as he took his eye off Christ, he would sink. He needed to pray and he needed the fellowship of his brethren. He couldn't do it alone. But Peter at this point felt that one of his greatest strengths was his personal ability, his personal loyalty to Christ. And Jesus will continually work Peter through that to help him realize that he needs to lead from among his brethren. These are things that Peter will be taught. And so too, each of us have different things with our character development that God will continually work with us on throughout our lives that will take a lifetime for us to truly learn. Well, we're told that the next day, after this event takes place, over in John chapter 6 and verse 4, that the Passover had arrived, and the day after the Passover, after Jesus had feed, fed the 5,000, that Jesus was continuing to drive the multitude to make a commitment. And as he drove the multitude to make a commitment the next day, he's telling them in John chapter 6 of the need for them to eat his flesh and to drink his blood. And as the multitudes listened to these words, they realized they really weren't interested. They weren't interested in making a commitment. Once the handouts stopped, the multitudes were gone. And at the end of the chapter, Jesus looks around and he sees his disciples. And he asks them the question, will you also go away? Sometimes we can look at Jesus as though he was almost a robot, mechanically going through Scripture, knowing what needed to be fulfilled. But just imagine how difficult this would have been for Jesus at this moment. One year out from giving his life for these people, and they were unwilling to make a commitment when he was committing to giving his life. How discouraging could that have been for Jesus as he saw the multitudes walking away when he put that decision before them. And he turns to his disciples and he says, will you also go away? Look at the response of Peter here at the end of John chapter 6. At the end of John chapter 6 and verse 68, Peter doesn't need any time to think about a response. Instead, Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice where the focus is here in what Peter says. To whom shall we go? 
We believe and are sure. Peter's saying, Lord, this is a decision that we've made to follow you. And Jesus says, I need to correct something. I need to adjust what you've said just for a moment. He says in verse 70, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. One of you is a slanderer, a false accuser. And he spoke of Judas Iscariot, which Peter wouldn't know at this time. But he's saying, Peter, don't ever forget that I've called, I've called you twelve, and you've only answered the calling. And besides, you don't speak on behalf of all of your brethren here. In fact, one of you is going to betray me. And you can wonder what would have gone through Peter's mind as he thought about these things. Jesus is instructing him, don't be so confident in where you're at, Peter, at this point in time. Well, we're told as Jesus continued to walk forward in John chapter 7 and verse 1, that he decided that he would no longer be going down to Judea until the time of the end was come. Because he knew that by going down to the south, it would accelerate his demise. It would accelerate the coming of his death. But Jesus was not yet finished. He still had more work to do. And as a result, what Jesus does is he takes his disciples as far away from Jerusalem as possible. He takes them up into the north, the furthest most part north in Israel, to Caesarea Philippi at the foot of Mount Hermon. The Jewish expectation is that Messiah would come and that he would cast off the shackles of the Roman Empire. This was also the expectation of his disciples. But in recent weeks, Jesus had rejected when others had tried to make him king. And instead he had fled, gone into the mountain, sent his disciples away. His disciples must have been wondering what was happening. Instead of gaining momentum for his kingdom, it seemed that momentum was being lost as the multitudes walked away from Christ. And instead of going down to Jerusalem, they're now traveling with Jesus to the most north point in Israel. What exactly was going on? Well, Jesus needed to get his disciples away from all the noise, all the distraction of what was going on around them, and he needed to prepare them for what lay ahead. And so he asked them the question. He asked them the question in Matthew chapter 16, if we could turn back there for a moment, as to who it is that men said that he was. You can see this over in Matthew chapter 16, of where he's speaking to his disciples. And he says, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they go on to describe for him some of the things that the people were saying. Well, some say that you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But Jesus now makes it intensely personal for his disciples. And he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And look at what Peter says here yet again. Nothing has changed for Peter. And he says in verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this declaration by Peter is met by somewhat of a different response from Jesus, from what we experienced at the end of John 6. Because if we continue reading, we see what Jesus says in verse 17. He says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church or my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Why this different response here from the Lord? Well, I believe that there was no longer the momentum that Jesus had before. If you look at all the things that others were saying about Jesus, it was Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Not one response that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. But Peter speaks up boldly again. Nothing had changed in regards to Peter's confidence. And this really would have bolstered the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus struggled with preparing his disciples for what lay ahead. 
You can see this messianically in the Psalms. In Psalm 69 and verse 6, where he says, Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. And messianically, this was a prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ for his disciples, that they might be prepared. And as Jesus looked to his disciples to see, what are you taking away from all of it? Peter speaks up and makes the proclamation that he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And these words are given to Peter that would have been incredibly encouraging. Now, when this is given to Peter, when he says Simon Bar-Jonah or Simon son of Jonah, it comes up three different times. Yet again, another three in the life of Peter. And every time that he addresses Peter as Simon son of Jonah, it's marking a change in Peter's life. He speaks of a present state, of who he is today and what it is that he's going to become. So take a look at this. When he's first introduced to Jesus in John 1 and verse 41, he's given a new identity. He says, today you're Simon, well, you're going to be Cephas. You're going to be a stone. I'm going to transform you from the natural into the spiritual. After he's given a new identity here, He's told why he's given that new identity, what his role, what his responsibility is going to be in the future. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 17, he says, You are Peter, well, I'm going to build my ecclesia on you. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, a present tense of who he is today and a future tense of the vision, of the role that he has for him in the future. Peter would lead the unlocking of the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And later on, when he's questioned on the seashore, on John 21, he's given a new focus. That if, Peter, if you really want to do this job, if you really want to live up to the responsibility that I've given to you, then your focus needs to change. If you love me today, then you need to focus on feeding the flock, on tending the flock, on caring for your brethren. Love for Christ is shown in how we treat others, in the shepherding of our brothers and sisters. And he's teaching Peter with each and every one of these revelations, this is where you're at today, this is where you're going in the future, to try to give Peter a vision of what lay ahead. But why would this have been so important for Peter? Why would this have been helpful for him? Well, he was given a name change before, but now Jesus is revealing to him why he was given that name change what it is that he had in store for him, that he was going to be a pivotal member of the ecclesia and the spreading of the early gospel. He was given his role as the leader of the disciples. This wasn't just an assertion by Peter, but he's telling Peter that you're going to be the leader. You are the rock. This, this foundation, the declaration that you've made and your role within it will be critically important to the spreading of the gospel. And so these words were actually spoken by Jesus, by his master, in the presence of the fellow disciples. And the authority that he's given, the keys of the kingdom. And you think about when somebody is given the keys of the city and the authority that goes along with that. These are the things that Peter had in store. And they're linked to the forgiveness of sins in John 20 and verse 23. And in Acts 10 verses 42 and 43, these two, two keys that are used with the unlocking of the door to the Jews in Acts 2 and the unlocking of the door to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. Peter is told here a very important message that he would be a foundational pillar in the ecclesia of God. How would you receive these words from the Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of your brothers and sisters? Without even thinking about it, it would be very easy for our heads to inflate just a little bit, for our chest to, to puff out a little bit as the Lord Jesus Christ speaks such amazing words concerning us. And I believe that's what happens inadvertently to Peter here, as we'll see the events continue to unfold in the narrative. Remember, this is a future tense of what it is that Christ has in store for Peter. The point is that Peter isn't quite ready for it yet. But Jesus wants him to know that he has a very important role for him in the future, to continue to motivate him to keep pressing forward, 
even though he would struggle at the present time. There's something in what Jesus says to Peter that's meant to really evoke humility on the part of Peter. Look at the reason for why he's giving these blessings to Peter. It wasn't because of Peter's abilities or his amazing intellect in putting together pieces that nobody else could. It doesn't have to do anything with Peter personally at all in regards to his natural abilities. But instead, look at where Jesus places the emphasis in what he says. He says, Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Jesus is giving the credit to God here that God had revealed it to Peter. Yes, Peter had made this declaration in faith, but as Jesus is saying these amazing words to Peter, he's trying to redirect his mind to the fact that God had given him these responsibilities. It's very important for us to remember that God has a role prepared for each and every one of us in the kingdom. The challenge that faces God is that we're not ready for that role yet. Patience is something that's very difficult for us to show, especially in the age in which we live, of where we're used to getting instant answers. We don't know something, we Google it. We want something, we order it on Amazon Prime and it arrives on our doorstep two days later. But that's not how transformation works. Patience was not one of Peter's strong suits. And it's not one of our strong suits quite often as well. When we have an issue and we pray to God, when would we want an answer? Well, yesterday would be great, but immediately would also suffice, wouldn't it? <laughs> Patience is something that God is working on each one of us with. And he gives us a vision of the kingdom on what's in front of us to motivate us to continue to press forward. That's what he's doing here for Peter. As many of the other disciples, Peter desired to be a leader. Jesus never chastises them for their desire to lead, but he needs to work on their motivation for why they want to lead. Even Paul says that he who desires the office of a bishop desires a good work, but he works on the motivation of the disciples because their motivation wasn't quite right. He links it instead to the attitude of the Gentiles who want to exercise lordship over each other. In fact, over in Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 to 28, he speaks some words to the disciples to help to recalibrate their minds of what leadership really means. He says in Matthew 20, verse 26, But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. It was great that they wanted to lead, but the point that was being pressed upon Peter and the others is that leadership is not about supremacy. It's about service. And leadership is demonstrated by elevating others and abasing ourselves. That's what life in the Ecclesia is all about. That's what leadership really is, is it's about servitude. And he's trying to teach Peter that as he's laying out for him this huge role of responsibility in the future. Can you imagine receiving this type of commendation from the Lord Jesus Christ? As Peter rose on the heights of receiving this commendation, he finds himself in a rather precarious position because we're quite often told that pride comes before a fall. And the heights that he was riding on, I believe, were not truly the heights of spirituality, as we'll see in how the Lord addresses him. Jesus, at this point, was looking for reassurance as to where his disciples were at. He brought them up to Caesarea Philippi to prepare them for the crucifixion that was less than a year away. And having received this confirmation from his disciples that they still believed on him, he now goes to the true intent of why he had brought them to the north. And he begins to roll out to them what it was that he was going to endure in graphic detail. Take a look at Matthew 16 and verse 21. This is right after the event of where Peter receives this commendation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Right after it. It says, from that time forth, 
began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Jesus wasn't just telling his disciples what was going to happen. It tells us that he was showing his disciples in graphic detail. As they would watch Jesus, Jesus would show them visibly what was going to happen to him. And they would see it in his visage, in his tone. Everything that the Lord said, his body language communicated to them the reality and the graphic nature of what was going to take place. Imagine the impact that this would have had on the disciples. The disciples are thinking, we're going down to Jerusalem to set up the kingdom. Peter, in his mind, has just been given the keys of the kingdom. He's thinking, we're going to go down to Jerusalem, we're going to set up the kingdom, and Christ says, we are going to Jerusalem. But it's going to be different than what you expect. It's going to be exactly the opposite. And look at how Jesus rolls this out to the disciples. Can you see how Matthew captures this? That he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, and the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day, piece by piece by piece. Jesus is rolling it out to the disciples, and you can just imagine them staggering backward like a slug to the chest each time they hear yet another thing that's going to happen to their Lord that doesn't align with their expectations. And as Peter would look around at his fellow disciples, in his mind with the context of the blessing that he had just received, he would see the slumped shoulders, the horrified looks, the defeated body language on the part of his disciples, and he would think, this needs to stop. This can't continue. This is destroying the rest of the disciples. And he thinks, I need to take action to stop this. I need to do something right now. And that's what Peter does. Peter takes action in verse 22. And he actually interrupts Jesus. It says that he took Jesus. It means that he physically took hold of Jesus and moved him to the side, away from the rest of the disciples. And if you just stop there for a moment, under no circumstance, no matter what motivation, good, bad, or whatever, would it have been appropriate for Peter to interrupt Jesus, to pull him to the side, and to begin to rebuke him for the things that he was saying? The thing that Jesus is told by Peter here is to pity yourself when you look at the margin. Pity yourself. These things won't happen to you. This was the last thing that Jesus needed to hear right now from one of his best friends, to be told that you don't need to go through with what God has prepared for you. You don't need to do it. Take pity on yourself. It's so important that we're very careful in the advice that we give to each other as we're going through trials. That advice that, that encourages us to pity ourselves, to don't be so hard on yourself, to ease our shoulder from the plow in what God has prepared for us is not helpful advice to give to each other as we're pressing toward the kingdom. Because what Peter is telling Christ is you don't have to do what God said. Peter would never say that outright to, to Jesus, just like we would never say that to each other. You don't have to do what God says. But isn't that the implication here? God isn't right in this regard. And Jesus responds to Peter in the exact same way that he responds in the wilderness. Because this temptation is the same temptation that Jesus was faced with in the wilderness. Back in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 8 through 10, you can have all the kingdoms of men now. You don't need to go through the cross. Forget the cross and just seize the crown for yourself. And Jesus responds the exact same way now as he did then. Get thee behind me, Satan. And what would have taken place is as Peter and the Lord are standing off to the side, Jesus turns his back on Peter because they are no longer aligned. And he speaks to Peter while looking at the rest of the disciples with his back to Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest the things that be of men more than the things that be of God. He says, you are an offense to me in verse 23. 
That word for offense is scandalon, and it's where the English word scandal comes from. It's an impediment, a trap, or a snare. And Peter, just note the turn of phrase here. Peter goes from being a foundational rock in the building of the house of God to now still being a rock, but being a rock of stumbling, a rock of offense. The difference here is because he was no longer aligned with Christ. He was still a stone, but that stone was now a stumbling block for his Lord because he was no longer in alignment with where his Lord was trying to go. Peter never forgot this rebuke. And I believe that's what's behind these words in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Peter was stumbling at the word. And this word offense is the same one that comes up that Jesus spoke to him back here in Matthew chapter 16. We too can be the same. Each one of us is a living stone. But what will we do as a living stone? Will we be a living stone in the house of God? Or will we find ourselves as a rock of offense, a stumbling block to others? It all depends on how well we align ourselves with the will of God and how intentional we are in that regard. But Peter isn't being cast off by Jesus. Peter cares, or Jesus cares rather deeply for Peter. And he goes on to tell him in verse 26, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. And if we're wondering what the motivation there was of Peter, Jesus is putting his finger on, the, on the, the motivation here. And he's saying, Peter, there's an element of self-preservation, of your role within that kingdom, of seeking to preserve your own life. That's part of the counsel that you're giving me here. But Peter, Peter, the time is not now. When I come in the kingdom, then I will give to every man according to his reward. This is something that Peter needed to learn, that the cross came before the crown. And as Peter reflects on his life 30 years later in 1 Peter, over 18 times he brings up to the believers that sufferings must happen in this life to prepare us for the life that is to come. That they are of absolute importance and necessity to transform our characters into who God is trying to get us to be. And as we go through our own transformation, we need to be asking ourselves the question, do I believe that God is right in everything? And secondly, do I believe that all things, all things are working together for my eternal good? Because if we can start with that foundation, that God is right with everything, and that all things are working together for our eternal good, then it can help to mitigate the questions of why is this happening to me? Why is this not in somebody else's life? Is this fair? All of that goes out the window because we know that God is right and that these things are happening for our eternal good if we love God because we know that we've been called according to His purpose. And so these things are in Peter's life for his good. Peter isn't cast into the corner now because he's made this huge mistake, this blunder in front of his fellow disciples. Jesus doesn't say, I can't work with you anymore. But instead, six days later, when we get to Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1, six days later, he's still working with Peter. Peter, James, and John go up to see the transfiguration. He knows how much Peter is struggling, and he wants to strengthen Peter. He wants to give him a vision of the kingdom that Peter if you can make it through this, there's glory that awaits. And he gives him a real-life vision of what awaited him, something that Peter would never, ever forget. In 2 Peter, we can see him making reference to this. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. 
Peter, it says in Mark chapter 9, as he saw Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, because he didn't know what to say, said, well, let's make three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus. And while he's speaking, we're told here that a voice interrupts him from heaven and says, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Helping Peter to see that Peter needed to listen to Jesus. All the prophets who came before were not to be compared with Jesus. And the voice of God is helping Peter to realize he needs to follow Jesus. This is who it is that he's following. This is what it means. He could declare with his mouth that this was the Son of God. But this impressed upon Peter in a way that he would never forget of what it meant to be the Son of God, of who it was that he was truly following. Once again, 30 years later, recalling when he was an eyewitness of what it is that God had shown to him. So let's pause for a moment, being at the end of our time, and reflect on what it is that we've learned from this part of Peter's conversion, of where he's learning to be a disciple. With the event of walking on the water, he learned that faith and focus, prayer to his heavenly Father, and fellowship with his brethren were all essential aspects if he wanted to make it to the kingdom. He couldn't do it in his own ability. And it's such a tough lesson for us to learn as well, that we can't do it on our own ability. We need to rely on Christ, and we need to rely on each other. With the confession of Christ, he learned that God has a role prepared for him, but he needed patience. And it's the same thing for us. When we receive positive recognition for something that we've done, enjoy it for about 10 seconds. And then move on and keep pressing forward because pride comes before a fall and God is continuing to transform our character just as he was continuing to transform Peter. From the rebuke by Christ, he learns that God is right, that we must follow, that the cross must come before the crown. To not look at trials and afflictions as something that prevents us from getting to the kingdom, but to see them as a necessary element designed to transform our characters to help us be there with Christ. And from the transfiguration, we're reminded of the fact that even though we make mistakes, even though we sin against God, that God will not cast us off. If we want to be with Jesus more than anything else in the world, He will continue to work with us to develop a vision of the kingdom to help to drive us and to motivate us to keep pressing forward. We will all stumble in life. But when we stumble, let's stumble upward. Let's stumble so that we're closer to our Lord. So that in the end, we can continue to draw close. We can continue to be transformed. And we can continue to place our confidence in God. Being patient and being confident. Knowing that God is working out His salvation with us each and every day. Let's use this week as an opportunity to develop a vision of that kingdom that will keep motivating us to press forward as we learn to be disciples.